Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Zoo School Live. My name is Laura, and today we're going to dive into our local waterways and talk about some unsung critter heroes that often go unnoticed, but are actually very important in our local waterways and our local food web. So before I get started, just a reminder, if you have any questions as we go along, make sure you drop those in the comments. I'll be looking through them at the end and trying to answer some for you. And as always, thank you again for tuning in. We appreciate your follow, uh, you guys following us and make sure you tune in again later this week on Thursday. So we're going to jump in to our topic, which is macro invertebrates. So for those of you who maybe have never heard that term, we can kind of break it down a little bit. So macro is a little different from micro. Micro means very, very small. Macro actually means that they're relatively big. They're still small in the grand scheme of things, but you don't need a microscope or a magnifying glass necessarily to see them. So macro meaning kind of small, but also kind of big. And then invertebrate means they have no backbone. So they're not a mammal, bird, reptile, amphibian. They are going to be insects and other invertebrates, things without a backbone. And I actually have a whole lot of examples here today we're gonna look at. Because macro invertebrates might be a little bit on the smaller side, but they have a very important and big role in our ecosystem. So they actually can tell us how healthy a stream is. So I actually went out today and collected some of these guys from our stream right behind the zoo. We're actually right on Stony Creek, which if you're not familiar is a trout fishery, which means that it's very cold, fast running water. And they actually release trout in there every single spring. And uh, it's a pretty important part of our watershed. A watershed is just kind of a fancy way of saying a big area where all the streams and rivers and uh, other bodies of water, flowing water, run into a larger water source. So we live in the Delaware watershed. Now this map here kind of shows you some of the different areas looking here of the Delaware watershed. So the Delaware River starts pretty far up north, moves its way down to the Delaware Bay, and our area is included in part of that. So the Schuylkill River, which is also very nearby, would be part of the Delaware watershed. And the Delaware River includes over 13 million people involved in this watershed. And we'll come back to why that's so important and why these little critters are so important, but it covers a huge area in New York, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and New Jersey, which is pretty awesome. So we're gonna get into our little critters. I actually have a couple different bins set up. These were all collected in our stream. And we're gonna start off with some little friends that are kind of swimming around in these cups. So macro again, meaning small, but not so small that you need a magnifying glass or a microscope to see them. So you're gonna see some little things wiggling around. We have several different types here and we're gonna go through and try to identify them. And then we're also gonna talk about whether or not they need a very healthy habitat or if they are tolerant of pollution. So we'll start off with our little friends here in the back and I'm actually gonna move their cup up so we can get kind of a side view of them too. So these little guys kind of look a little maybe creepy and crawly, a little bit like leeches, but they are called planaria. So planaria have this really squishy long body they kind of have a cute little triangle shaped face. And they're actually in the same group as things like worms and leeches, so they do belong to that same group. And planaria are often found on the bottom of stream rocks and things like that. So they stick to the surface of the rocks and creep around and crawl around. And they are going to be pretty tolerant to pollution. So they can be found in a wide variety of habitats. They don't need a super, super clean, um, pure creek to survive. They can survive in ponds and puddles basically all over the place. So if we find planaria in a stream, that doesn't necessarily tell us how healthy or unhealthy it is. They are found in a lot of different areas. And you can see they kind of change shape as they move, which is pretty cool. I can see if I can turn our cup here so you can see the bottom side of that long, squishy body moving along. They do kind of have a leech-like appearance, but they are not technically leeches. Now this type of animal would be at the very bottom of the food chain. They're gonna break down things like rotten leaf matter, 
um, and different uh, plant materials, but then they themselves would get eaten by bigger creatures. And that's why they're so important if we find planaria. They do provide a very valuable food source for a lot of our creatures in the stream. So we'll skip over here to our next little friends. These guys are gonna be a little bit more creepy, crawly, active. These are called scud or fairy shrimp. So scud or fairy shrimp are also found in a wide variety of habitats. They do prefer to be in some fast moving water many times, so streams and creeks, and they are less tolerant of pollution. That means that they need pretty clean water in order to survive. And you can see they are kind of called fairy shrimp because they, they do have a shrimp-like appearance and those little tiny legs almost make them look like they have little wings as they scuttle around in the water. They're pretty cute. Um, and we have a couple different sizes in there. So these guys are often found, again, hiding in little pools and puddles of creeks and streams. So our fairy shrimp or our scud. They're a little bit less tolerant of pollution. So planaria, our little leech guy shaped guys, they don't mind pollution. Um, scud or fairy shrimp, they can deal with a little bit of it. But getting into our next one, and this one is very exciting for us to find, we have a mayfly nymph. So he's gonna swiggle around a little bit there and we'll see if he'll settle down. So mayfly nymphs are very intolerant of pollution. They cannot survive in polluted water, at least not for very long. Now, I used the word nymph. Nymph is kind of just another way to describe a young life stage of an insect. So last week we talked about butterflies, we learned about metamorphosis, them going through different life stages. This little critter that we're looking at here, this mayfly nymph, will eventually go through what's called incomplete metamorphosis. So it won't necessarily form a chrysalis or a cocoon. It will change over into its adult form though. So they start off living underwater and then they end up coming out onto land and actually in a mayfly's case they grow a set of wings so they become a winged creature and will then fly out of uh, fly around outside of their aquatic habitat so i have a cool picture this is what a mayfly will eventually grow up to be so it starts off as a small nymph living in the water they are carnivorous so they do eat other little macroinvertebrates so if we look at our planaria, they eat plants, then they get eaten by bigger things like our mayflies. And then as an adult, they come up out of the water, they grow wings, they fly around. They have a very short lifespan, but they are so important to so many different animals' food chains. They get eaten by a ton of different things. So this little guy right here still has a lot of growing to do, but they are, as I said, very intolerant of pollution. They can't survive in polluted streams. So the fact that we found one today is a really good sign. And that can help us better understand the health of our overall watershed and our stream here. So moving on here, in these tubs, I've got a couple different things going on. So I kind of wanted to point out that it doesn't take an expert to go out and find these little critters. In fact, if you're interested in doing this yourself, you only need a few special tools. I actually just use a plastic spoon and a little paintbrush and then some kind of little container. And the paintbrush helps you to kind of scoop your little friends off the rocks. The spoon can be good for scooping them out of the water. And then, of course, you want to provide them a little dish with water to sit in while you're observing them. So this is kind of a general setup we do when we're studying these guys. We create little habitats for them. Now, if we look at this first one, it might not look like there's a whole lot going on in there right now. It looks kind of boring. But if I just take my little spoon and kind of stir it up a little bit, you might notice some little friends start to swim around. You might see on the surface, we've got some little beetles hanging out here. Inside, we've got some more planaria, really stretched out. They look pretty cool down there. And you might even see, in this one, we had a mosquito larva. Oh, he's over here, there he is. So mosquito larva, not always fun for us to see, um, but they are important in the food chain as well. So even though they turn into things that we're not super fond of, in their larval stage, in their nymph stage, they are eaten by a lot of different things. So even if you're looking at a stream or a pond and you don't really think there's anything living there, if you just slow down and take a moment, 
you'll probably see different movement, different activity. So all of these little critters, all of these macroinvertebrates love to live on the bottoms of rocks, underneath leaves, and in the algae and plant matter that grows in the stream or on the stream bank. So that's the best place to find them. And to kind of demonstrate how we collect them, I have a couple rock areas we can look at here. So you might have noticed on this one here, we have a few water striders, which are, I feel like, everybody's favorite little friends to see um, skipping around on the surface of the water. We'll see if they'll move around a little bit so you can see them. So they would live on the surface, not necessarily under the rocks, but if we carefully pick up our rocks here, we can see if there's anybody home. So when you look underneath, you wanna watch for movement. Kinda of hold the rock for a moment, see if anything wiggles around. I don't see anybody on there, so we're gonna gently go ahead and put that one down. And then we'll just rotate this big guy, see if anybody's on here. Oh, we've got a little beetle, it looks like, a little uh, whirly gig beetle walking around. There's definitely some good algae on here. So, oh, and there looks like maybe a little tiny scud. So you just take your little brush and you can gently scoop if you wanna scoop them off and then you put them in the water. This guy's gonna be, of course, very hard to grab. There you go. You can see him kind of scuttle away. So that's kind of the easy way to look for these little creatures, just turning over rocks in the stream. Now, of course, we wanna be very gentle because this is their home and we don't want to hurt them or disturb them too much. So our last little grouping over here are two really, really cool macroinvertebrates. Not that the rest of them weren't really exciting, um, but I wanna show you this big guy first. This one right here. So this is actually a dragonfly nymph. So he's pretty large, you can kind of see compared to my finger and compared to some of the other ones. Oh, where did he go? <laughs> Under this rock, here we go. There he is. So you can see, compared to the mayfly, the scud, the planaria, they're pretty large, and they will get even larger than that. So just like the mayfly, if this guy is going to go through a transformation and eventually will come out of the water in unfold adult form, and will be a dragonfly. And I'm gonna just set our rock kind of off to the side here so I can show you guys what a dragonfly, in case you're not sure, what a dragonfly looks like when it is an adult. So that little creature that we're looking at in the water is eventually gonna come out with wings just like that mayfly, have some kind of bright, beautiful color. Sometimes they're blue, purple, green, all over the color spectrum, and will fly around. So water habitats like the streams and ponds where all these little critters live are very, very important for the life cycle of a lot of different species. So stoneflies, mayflies, dragonflies included. Now we're gonna be very careful with our little dragonfly friend because they are carnivorous as well and they do have little mouth parts that can nibble. So again, our planaria, our scud, they would be eaten by stoneflies, mayflies, dragonflies, and then eventually dragonflies would get eaten by bigger things part, as part of that food web. Now our last little friend here couple of them. There's one right here. It probably doesn't look like a whole lot, but this guy right here is called a water penny. And they get the name water penny because they do have a very flat, round, kind of copper colored body. And they are gonna uh, spend a lot of time hanging out on the bottom of rocks. They're gonna stick to those rocks and creep around. I think there's a couple other ones on this side, maybe. Oh yeah, they're really tucked in there. You can see they camouflage super, super well with the bottom of the rock. And they are another type that's gonna eat more of the tiny little plankton and um, different types of plant material and things like that. They're not gonna be carnivores or hunters or anything like that. So those are all of our different macros that we found today. I do have one more semi-example. We have a, a crayfish exoskeleton, which is pretty cool. So crayfish look a little bit like lobster. They might look familiar to you. And these guys are found across streams and lakes and ponds. You've probably seen them before. And they are another example of a macroinvertebrate. Now technically, they are a crustacean. They're related to crabs and lobsters, things like that. And they're a lot bigger than most of the other stuff we were looking at today. But they are still a bioindicator of health. 
So they can tell us, based on where they're found, whether that place is healthy or not, because they need pretty good oxygen levels in the water at times, they need constant temperature, and they do need food sources. So these would eat plant material, little bacteria, and other types of macros. So our food chain is very, very dependent on the survival of these small creatures. I have a little bit of a graphic here we can look at. So starting in our aquatic food chain, we have different kinds of plankton and bacteria and very small things. Moving up to the next level, this is our macro invertebrate level. So we have things like stoneflies and mayflies, water pennies, caddisflies. They all get eaten by slightly bigger things like the crayfish and different beetles. And eventually they get eaten by fish. And who likes to eat fish? Well, aside from, you know, different types of birds and things, humans do as well. So why should we care about these tiny little creatures that we generally don't see unless we really go looking for them? Well, that's because we are part of this food chain and our health depends on the health of our waterways as well. Remember, 13 million people belong to the Delaware River watershed. And whether or not you eat fish, you're probably eating something that had contact with that water at one point. So making sure that our creeks and our streams are very healthy is a human health issue. And so when we do studies like this, we can get a quick glance at, glimpse at what is happening in our area. So this is really great. We found a couple species today that are not tolerant of pollution. Dragonflies, our mayflies, they are not really tolerant of pollution. So that means that Stony Creek right here next to the zoo is pretty healthy. And that makes us happy because that means that hopefully any water that's coming through the zoo is going to be healthy as well. So it's not just about the food chain directly involving these guys, it's about the greater picture that involves us and where we live and the water we use and the food that we eat. So the health of our local streams and watershed does impact our health too. So before we kind of wrap up for today, I have another friend I wanna share with you who would very much be affected by the health of a waterway. If you guys tuned into zoo school in the spring, you would have remembered meeting her. Her name is Woody. And Woody would be found in an aquatic, uh, semi-aquatic habitat. So Woody is a wood turtle, and she's gonna come over here and hang out in our little pool. So wood turtles are found throughout the Northeast, and they do enjoy living in both a land and aquatic habitat. They spend a lot of time in the water. So I have a nice little warm bath set up for Woody here. We're going to see if she wants to show off some of her swimming. She's actually got a pretty flat shell compared to some other types of turtles. And this helps her to be very fast in the water, helps her to speed around. And then she also has some webbing in her, on her feet. So that helps her to paddle. If you look at her back feet, she's got these huge, huge paddles that help her to push the water around and explore in her aquatic habitat. So wood turtles are found in Pennsylvania. Unfortunately, they are a species that is threatened. There are not very many of them left. And um, because of this, we have to make sure we do everything we can to protect their habitats. That's one of the big reasons for their disappearance is habitat loss. So Woody prefers to live in kind of mountainous um, areas where there are cold running streams. So she would be found in the same type of habitat as many of our uh, aquatic macroinvertebrates would be found as well. So if the habitat is healthy for them, it's probably going to be healthy for Woody. But the reverse is also true. If there aren't very healthy habitats like lakes and streams where she can explore, she's not gonna have a good place to live. So she would be not only looking to these little macros to kind of share her habitat, but she might eat them as well. So she's part of that food chain that all of these small aquatic macroinvertebrates belong to as well. So they provide her food source, they also share her habitat. So protecting our streams, our rivers, and things in our watershed not only impacts us, but would impact Woody. Now to help her get around, aside from those big paddle feet and that kind of flat shell, she does have some pretty sharp claws and those would help her to grab onto the rocks and logs and move around the forest floor and kind of get in and out of her waterways. And then of course she also has some scales on her body. So her scales are gonna help protect her from anything rough that she's climbing on, 
They're gonna keep her safe from rocks and sticks and things like that too. And then she also has that camouflage to help her blend in with her woodland environment. Uh, that's actually where the term wood turtle comes from. If we take a close look at Woody's shell, we'll kind of move her a little bit here. Um, you might notice that it looks a little bit like carved wood, especially the texture and the color. And that's where the name comes from. Now, of course, the shell is not made out of wood. It is made out of bone and keratin, just like other turtle shells, but it does have a look to it um, like a carved piece of bark or wood, which is pretty cool. And that's gonna help her to blend in with leaves, rocks, fallen logs, anything that might be found in her habitat so that she does not have to worry about predators. Uh, but in the event that she is found, that shell, remember, is made of bone and keratin, not wood, so it is good protection. It's kind of like a suit of armor. So we'll let her kind of come over here, here over a minute. So Woody is a native animal. That means that they are found here in Pennsylvania and uh, they are found kind of throughout the Northeast in the United States. She is not an animal that you would want to bring home as a pet. And unfortunately, the pet trade is another threat that she faces because people find them in their, in their you know, habitat here. They might be hiking, they come across a turtle and they think, oh wow, she's really cool, really beautiful and they wanna bring her home. Unfortunately, that happens enough that their population has started to decline from that as well. So it's not just habitat loss, but also from people bringing wood turtles home because they find them around here. It's best to leave them in their natural habitat. So we can hang out with Woody for just a moment. I'm gonna see if we have any questions today about our macro invertebrates. Let's see here. And remember, if you think of anything, even after we're done today, you are welcome to leave a comment and I will hop on there later. Oh, someone said fairy shrimp. I love them. I do too. I think it's the most fun name, Carl. Thanks for the shout out. All right, let's see. No main questions for now, which is totally okay. Again, if you guys have anything you come up with later on, please pop them in the comments. And I hope you enjoyed hanging out with myself and Woody and of course all of our small little macro friends. I hope you had a good time learning a little bit about something that you maybe haven't gotten this close to look at. But again, if you're interested in learning more, you can actually do this on your own. If you'd like to watch a little tutorial, we actually have a nature play video about looking under logs and under stream rocks and things like that. You can find that on our Facebook or our YouTube. And of course, thank you guys for tuning in. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and we'll see you on Thursday.